and it's BBOR, Black Box, online radio, coming to you from West Virginia, Black Box Ned 88 on Instagram for the bonus podcast. And hello and welcome to this special presentation about the Zodiac Killer. My name is Ned DeHaan and I will be your host. Every Monday here on Black Box Online Radio, I do a regular segment called Zodiac Mondays, where I talk about the Zodiac Killer. And lately, it's been done as the Zodiac Killer News Report. However, over the previous years, I have numerous episodes, which are suspect profiles as well as book discussions. And if you would like to follow along with this particular mystery, I invite you to like and subscribe, as well as visiting the buymeacoffee.com page. There's a link to that in the description box. That allows you to make a contribution or donation to help support all of these efforts, and all contributors will get a shout-out on Zodiac Mondays. The Zodiac Killer was not only a serial killer, he was also someone who wrote letters, designed these cryptogram-like puzzles called ciphers, he made phone calls, he wrote strange messages and greeting cards, he wrote a bizarre message on a car door after one of his crimes, and not only was the Zodiac trying to taunt the police, and the media. He was also trying to clue in the general public to his identity. However, to the best of our knowledge, the Zodiac has not been identified, and the case remains unsolved at the time of this recording. The first Zodiac crime occurred on December 20th of 1968, with the murders of David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen. It was the double homicide at Lake Herman Road. Not much is known about this particular crime, because... Both victims did not survive the shooting, and they were unable to provide descriptions of the perpetrator. They were also unable to provide any info about who might have been after them. Is there some type of hidden motive associated with the Lake Herman Road murders? David Faraday and Betty Lou Jensen did lose their lives, though, and it appears that they were sitting in a parked car in more or less a gravel parking lot that is off of a side road, which is a shortcut between Benicia and Vallejo, California. They were ordered out of the vehicle, and then they were both shot with a twenty two caliber firearm. Whatever happened during those minutes or seconds is simply a mystery to this day. The second crime occurred on July 4th of 1969, and this saw the murder of Darlene Farron and the shooting of Mike Majot. A big difference is, Mike Majot survived the shooting and was able to give a description of the perpetrator. The car was parked at Blue Rock Springs, and somebody approached the passenger side car, passenger side door of the car. For the longest time, I thought that Mike Majot was sitting in the driver's seat and Darlene Farron was sitting in the passenger seat, but... That, of course, is not true. Darlene was driving, and Mike Majot was in the passenger seat. And there are numerous mainstream publications that get that backward to this day. But the Zodiac approached the passenger side of the car where Mike Majot was seated, and he began opening fire, shooting bullets into the car. Darlene Farron would lose her life, but Mike Majot would state that the the perpetrator was 5 feet 8 inches tall, maybe... 195 to 200 pounds, not overly fat, but had a rather beefy build, but he could not see any particular details of the perpetrator's face other than it was really big, and he made a brief remark about how he may have had reddish-brown curls in his hair. This would go on to lead to a lot of suspect discussions in the distant future, But something much more important happened after the murder of Darlene Farron. The shooting may have occurred around 11.55 p.m. on July 4th of 1969, but some people estimate that the shooting even occurred at 12.01 a.m. on July 5th. A phone call did come in from people who found Darlene and Mike at 12.10 a.m. Then Darlene Farron was taken to the hospital, as well as Mike, and Darlene Farron was pronounced dead at 12.38 a.m. on July 5th of 1969. Two minutes later, a phone call came at 12.40 a.m., and somebody said that he was responsible for the crimes. 
that he shot two people with a 9 millimeter Luger, and that he also committed a double homicide the previous year, and he signed off the phone call by saying, Goodbye. He spoke in a monotone voice, and he was almost mocking the dispatcher with the final goodbye. Then, something even more confusing happened. By the end of July 1969, July 31st, somebody mailed in a three-part cipher, a, a bizarre array of symbols, as well as three copies of a letter were mailed to newspapers, the Vallejo Times-Herald, the San Francisco Examiner, and of course the San Francisco Chronicle. And these cryptograms said that they would reveal the killer's identity. The killer also tried to show that he was the one responsible not only for the Blue Rock Springs shooting and the murder of Darlene Farron, but also the Lake Herman Road murders of 1968. He said very clearly that he would state some facts that only he and the police knew. Then he provided these cryptogram puzzles, and the real trick was to take one-third of each part of the cipher that had been mailed into the three newspapers and arrange them in a particular order, with the Vallejo Times-Herald part coming first. This was cracked by Don and Betty Harden, and the solution read something to the effect of, I like killing people because it's so much fun. It's even more fun than hunting wild game in the forest, because man is the most dangerous animal of all. To kill gives me the most thrilling experience. It's even better than getting your rocks off with a girl. And he would go on to say that when he dies, he would be reborn in paradise, and those we have killed will be his slaves. Some very odd ways of thinking. But to throw in one solid interjection, I do not believe that the real killer believed any of that stuff, that he was actually going to die and be reborn in paradise. Many people, including me, think that the Zodiac was simply playing a character, putting on a persona, developing this persona into some type of real-life comic book villain, and there are all of these attributes that the real person would not live out, such as a belief system about having slaves in paradise, or even that Hunting man is the most thrilling experience. These are things that the Zodiac persona would enjoy, but not necessarily the real person. And we'll see from a very early time that the Zodiac was all about blending states of being, and that might speak to his mental state. So, during the month of August, the Zodiac would also mail in another letter, perhaps on August 4th, although the envelope has not been stored to the best of my knowledge. Then, on September 27th of 1969, the Zodiac would do something even more bizarre. He would put on a hooded costume that had a black circle with a cross going through it in the center, and had clip-on sunglasses. And instead of bringing only a gun, he also brought a knife and pre-cut lengths of rope to this next crime scene, and he targeted Brian Hartnell and Cecilia Shepard at Lake Berryessa. The Zodiac drew a gun on them, and said that he was an escaped convict from Deer Lodge Prison in Montana, or something similar. It's not like Brian Hartnell had a tape recorder. He's just trying to remember this stuff. The Zodiac may have even said that he was from Colorado. So then, the Zodiac is holding them up with a gun. He orders Cecilia to tie up Brian, and then the Zodiac ties up Cecilia and double-checks Brian's restraints. Their hands were tied to their feet, more or less hog-tying them. And then the Zodiac decided to stab them in the back, stabbing Brian Hartnell in the back six times, and then Cecilia Shepard five times in the front and five times in the back, not counting any additional superficial lacerations that they may have suffered. Cecilia Shepard would pass away two days later in the hospital, and then Brian Hartnell would go on to survive again. The Zodiac did not write a letter after the Lake Berryessa stabbing, strangely, but he did write a message on the car door at Lake Berryessa that had the Zodiac symbol, the word Vallejo, and then the dates of Zodiac activity, 12 2068 7 Sept-2769, S-E-P-T. He abbreviated the word September, and 6.30 p.m., which was most likely the time that the stabbing concluded, then he wrote the words, by knife. And 
Why he chose to do that is still a mystery to this day. The next event was a phone call that came at 7.40 p.m., one hour and ten minutes after the Lake Berryessa stabbing, where the person on the phone said something to the effect of, if you go one mile east, you'll find two kids in a brown car, and that he was responsible for the crime. The next Zodiac crime occurred on October 11th of 1969, when a taxi driver, Paul Stein, was murdered in Presidio Heights in San Francisco. He was shot in the side of the head by the right ear, and a piece of his shirt was removed at some point that would be mailed in with future Zodiac correspondences. The Zodiac wanted to prove that he murdered Paul Stein. No woman was present, wasn't a lover's lane, wasn't a secluded area. It was in San Francisco, and he killed a taxi driver. Very bizarre. But what on earth was going on? Why would somebody commit the crimes in this particular way, where it seems that there's almost no pattern? Now, it's true that there is a very similar connection between the Lake Herman Road murders and the Blue Rock Springs shooting, and that is that they were both committed by gun. They were both having a either a silent perpetrator or someone who isn't interacting a lot with the victims committing the crime. Bear in mind that we don't know what was said at Lake Herman Road, but the victims are shot and the killer disappears into the night. That much seems very apparent. With the Lake Berryessa stabbing, it's completely different. The Zodiac went out in the daytime, not at night, switched from shooting the victims to stabbing them. They're tied up. He's having this conversation, telling this wild story. And for years, I just couldn't comprehend why somebody would do that, and it seemed like it was completely inconsistent with psychopathology. Not only that, the Zodiac would do something even weirder, going after Paul Stein with no woman present, and taking trophies like the piece of the bloody shirt that would be mailed in with multiple Zodiac correspondences. I find that there are two major competing theories that people have. One is that the Zodiac wanted to change the way he committed crimes to avoid getting caught. And this is something that is supported by Dr. Anthony LaPala, the forensic psychologist who I was talking about during the Phantom Killer series. Every Wednesday I do a show about the Phantom Killer from 1946, so I invite you to listen to that one as well. And what Dr. LaPala was saying is, that type of behavior is completely consistent with a spree killer, because... The killer is going to deviate from the previous crimes to avoid getting caught. The killer would absolutely do something on the fourth crime that is completely different from the third crime, and so on, because it's not what people are expecting him to do. They're expecting him to go after lovers' lanes, and a man and a woman sitting in a vehicle in a secluded area. It doesn't even require that much intelligence to think about it, that he's going to go after a taxi driver. He's going to do something different that people would not expect. But taking a piece of the cab driver's bloody shirt to mail in with correspondences, as well as his wallet, keys, maybe they were planned for something else, or maybe he just wanted to stage it like a robbery so that the authorities wouldn't immediately know that it was the Zodiac killer. The Zodiac was seen after the Stein shooting, and that's where we see the composite sketches of the Zodiac wearing the glasses. They were done um, based on the witness descriptions of two teenagers that were looking out from a nearby location, Lindsay and Rebecca Robbins. There's also a sighting by Officer Donald Falk on that night, but he did not contribute to the composite sketches. Okay, so that's why people think there's one killer, that one person designed this, one person making the phone calls, one person writing the letters, and someone is a serial killer who wants to add this taunting element to fuel his own excitement. Maybe he's even some type of schizophrenic, or maybe he isn't, and he's just some type of narcissist, a Machiavellian even, who is cold, methodical, and calculating. The other theory that people have is multiple killers, and I think the biggest variant of the multiple killers theory is that there were two killers the partnership, that one person committed the shootings and one person committed the stabbing. I said that there was a description of a 5'8 perpetrator at Blue Rock Springs. There was also a witness description of a 5'8 perpetrator after the Stein shooting on October 11th. 
on September 27th of 69 at Lake Berryessa. When Cecilia Shepard was in the hospital, she estimated that the Zodiac was six feet tall. Well, is the Zodiac five foot eight or is he six feet tall? That's why what people think there could have been two killers. And I have to give credit to Mike Rodelli, author of In the Shadow of Mount Diablo and the Hunt for Zodiac, who also added a particular element to that possibility that the handwriting on the car door at Lake Berryessa is very similar to the handwriting in the letter. So if there were two killers, could there have been the letter writer participating in one of the crimes, the Lake Berryessa stabbing, and the other three were done by his partner who is providing information? And he doesn't need to provide information about things that only the killer would know or that the police would know as well. Because in his heart and in his mind, in his gut, he, he knows that he committed the crime and he doesn't have to compensate for that. And that the, this is all a facade. I shall state some facts that only I and the police know to prove that I committed the crime. Here's a piece of the bloody shirt. Well, the reason why he's saying that stuff is because he didn't actually commit those murders. Somebody else did and he's just trying to make it look that way. But that's the partnership theory. Other people out there simply think that it's not two people, it was three people. And for a while, I genuinely thought that there were four different killers. I genuinely thought that back in 2019, after going through the Zodiac material for about two and a half years, because I thought that that's just the explanation that everybody was looking for, that there were four killers and one letter writer. There could have been five people. The Thrill Kill Club, the Four Horsemen of the Apocalypse. It has many different types of um, labels that you could attribute to that particular crime spree. But what makes sense to you out of those possibilities? Multiple killers or a single killer? The Zodiac would continue to write in letters and cards well into the 1970s. But the interesting thing is the Zodiac killer letters and cards went all the way to 2001. I mean, the 2001 card is one of the latest that is given strong consideration. Is that authentic? I'd probably say there's a 5 to 10 percent chance yes, and a 95 to 90 percent chance no. But a card that I think might have some more credibility is the 1990 Eureka card, or how about the 1986 letter? Which ones are authentic and which ones are not? There really are just an enormous amount of letters and correspondences attributed to the Zodiac Killer, as well as other ciphers, cryptograms, that could also be genuine Zodiac material. Many people believe that the final confirmed Zodiac letter was the 1974 Exorcist letter, which says, I saw and think that the Exorcist was the best satirical comedy ever, and... Then he goes on to quote a passage from the Mikado, says something that he plunged to the billowy wave in the suicide's grave, tit willow, tit willow, tit willow. And if I don't see this note in your paper, I'll do something nasty, which you know I'm capable of. And some weird symbols that look like imitation Japanese. That's actually what I think the Exorcist letter is, that it's just imitation Japanese. There's no greater meaning. But some people notice that there are frequent quotations of the Mikado. And was that what the Zodiac was trying to do? That there's one killer and he was just very inspired by the character of the Lord High Executioner in Gilbert and Sullivan's operetta, The Mikado. And if you watch this, it's all about punishing people for flirting. Three Zodiac crimes occurred at Lover's Lanes. And some people just think that the Zodiac is fueled by heterosexual animosity. He was the original incel, an involuntary celibate, and he was very resentful at heterosexual couples. Other people think that the Zodiac was a closeted homosexual, and he targeted heterosexual couples because he was envious of their ability to have conventional relationships, whereas a homosexual who was battling with his sexual identity, he was unable to do so. Do any of those possibilities strike a chord with you? Do you have any connection to them? Is there any way that you'd like to challenge those types of um, theories? And you can put your ideas in the comment section down below. Anything is welcome. Anybody who's sharing an idea in a respectful way, please feel free to put your response in the comment section down below. And the final thing that I would point out is there are numerous suspects in the case. Over 2,000 suspects, over 2,500 suspects even. And when I was first exploring the Zodiac Killer mystery, I went suspect by suspect here on Black Box Online Radio, 
And perhaps that wasn't the most practical way to go about it, because it was a very long time before I even learned the names of the victims. And it would have been so much more valuable to first look at not only the victims' stories, but also how the crimes were committed, and look at some possible motivations for the killer, as well as trying to find some solutions to the killer's ciphers. But what do you think about the Zodiac Killer mystery? Do you have a particular theory about what the Zodiac did? And not only that, but also why he chose to commit the crimes the way he did. And do you think that the letters and the ciphers and the pieces of writing will contain clues to the Zodiac's identity? And of course, the question that I'm always curious about, do you believe that there was one killer or multiple killers? And if you're going to answer that question in the comment section down below, please provide a supporting reason why. Tell me everything, and maybe your comments will be used in a future episode of the Zodiac Killer News Report, or some of the Zodiac Killer Q&A sessions that pop up from time to time. One more time, my name is Ned Dahan, and I host Zodiac Mondays here on Black Box Online Radio. Anybody can write the show at blackboxonlineradio at AOL.com. You can also get me on Facebook. My personal Facebook is in the description box, and there is always BlackBoxNid88 on Instagram. And I will see you over there for the bonus podcast. Until next time.